Hello, Michelle. Hello, Michael Ray. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today. My name is Michael Ray Charles. I'm the Hugh, Roy, and Lily Cran Franz Cullen Distinguished Professor of Painting here at the university. We're glad to have you everyone here, but before we uh, introduce our guests, I just want to note that we will have time for questions and answer period at the end. And I encourage you to add uh, your questions to the chat. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Michelle Grabner, Crown Family Professor of Art at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Professor Grabner holds a BFA in painting and drawing and an MA in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and an MFA from Northwestern University. Professor Grabner has had a long and dynamic career interacting with, with the world of art and culture in a range of ways. As an artist, she's worked in a variety of mediums, including drawing, painting, video, and sculpture. And her work has been shown in galleries and museums, nationally and internationally. With over 50 solo exhibitions and more than 150 uh, group exhibitions, she's also had an, an active and important presence writing about art of our time in various publications, including Art Forum, Freeze, Art Press, Art Agenda, Sculpture Magazine, and Extra. In addition to over 20 years, Professor Grabner and her husband, Brad Kilner, Kilman, have run the legendary exhibition space, The Suburban, in Chicago. In, two, in 2008, they founded a second space, The Poor Form in Wisconsin. The two projects have hosted hundreds of artists, both unknown and well-known, who have been given the freedom to explore their work and ideas. And at the other end of the curatorial spectrum, she is one of three co-curators of, of the 2014 Whitney Biennial of American Art. Lastly, Professor Grabner has a long and dedicated record as an educator. After, being, after beginning her teaching career at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, she joined the faculty of the School of the Art in Chicago in 96, where she now serves as the chair of the painting and drawing. And in 2011, she became the visiting professor of painting and printmaking at Yale, at the Yale School of Art. She's also lectured throughout the country and abroad about her work and ideas. And indeed, this is her fourth visit to the University of Houston School of Art. Please welcome Michelle Grabner. Thank you, Michael Ray. You're welcome. It's good to be here. It's good to um, uh, vicariously be in Houston. Um, I would like to start by sharing uh, my slides. Um, but I'm going to go pretty quickly through um, the work that I'm doing, which is curatorial, which uh, looks at some of the exhibition spaces that I run uh, with my husband. Um, and we'll get to my studio um, at the end and what's coming out of the studio now. Um, but I would really like it to be discursive. I'd really like to have a kind of back and forth once we get to the end. These are uh, strange formats. It's really hard to get a sense of um, um, uh, who my audience is, um, that kind of response. So um, I think if we can keep it lively, that would be great. So I'm going to share my screen. There we go. And I'm going to start out by addressing where I am. I'm actually in rural Wisconsin. So I live in Milwaukee, but I teach at the Art Institute. So I'm moving around. And in rural Wisconsin, we have the exhibition space uh, called the Poor Farm. And we've been running the Poor Farm since 2009. And you can kind of see it. If you look behind this project right here, which is a very familiar uh, kind of marker sign, um, but it has nothing on it. Um, uh, this is the artist Paul Druka. He lives in Milwaukee. 
Um, and he really plays with the signifiers of information. And in this case, there's no information because many of us don't know what the poor farm is as a history. But if you look behind here, it's very difficult to see. You see this, uh, it's a large building. It's a large institutional building where we host exhibitions. And I'll just walk through some of the exhibitions that we've hosted in the past, including the artist uh, um, and painter, uh, Monique Prieto. Um, she's based in LA and Monique was somebody who was very important to me for a very long time, uh, painting in the 80s, thinking about abstraction, thinking about the body. And we invited her a couple years ago to take over the poor farm. Um, and she created a very site specific uh, um, installations in each room. Uh, this is just one example where she's thinking about the idea of not only moons or the cycles of moons, but the abstraction of the circle um, in relationship to color. And you can also see a sound um, element hanging down from the space. Um, somebody who some of you may know, um, Lily Cock Richards, um, who spent some time um, uh, working at um, uh, the Glassell uh, core program. Uh, she was here very early on. Um, I want to say it was 2010, perhaps, where she was crafting these mushrooms um, and storing them um, in exhibition, uh, in a kind of exhibition space in um, the cellar of the poor farm. And then she had mushrooms that also occupied uh, the exterior. In the back of the poor farm is a cemetery. So um, without going too deep into what a poor farm institution is, um, you know, it was a place where if one did not have a place to go um, in the 19th century, you know, one was actually an inmate at a poor farm. Um, you could not just basically walk the North American continent without means. Um, you know, prior to that, uh, you were, could be sold off into a kind of indentured servitude. Um, but the poor farm was based on, think of Dickens, um, the old English almshouses where you worked the farm. Um, and that's what was going on. So poor houses, poor farms are part of that um, uh, European, uh, excuse me, that um, uh, social system. And there's a graveyard behind the poor farm where the inmates at the poor farm um, would be buried. And you can see where, you know, pandemics went through and a lot of people died in uh, 1918. You can see um, that on the headstones. And anyways, um, um, Lily also installed a bunch of mushrooms um, in the old uh, uh, graveyard as well. Um, other projects at the Poor Farm, a very important exhibition, um, uh, did a lot of research on the artist Gretchen Bender. Uh, Gretchen Bender is no longer with us. She was very um, prominent in the 80s, um, you know, kind of affiliated with the picture generation um, and would do these large television installations, these video installations, mostly at the kitchen in New York in the 80s. And uh, we basically transferred a bunch of tapes, a bunch of old beta tapes and started reinstalling it. So this is a um, total recall. Um, you know, she's really looking at and critiquing media um, and uh, kind of capital and conglomerates. Um, so that's what's going on here. Again, these are all televisions, um, you know, multi, uh, um, uh, channeled installations. And the current exhibition, if you'd come and visit us uh, now, is by the artist uh, Sky Hapinka. Sky Hapinka is a Ho-Chunk artist. Um, he teaches at Bard. Um, I got to know him as uh, a, uh, he was a grad student at the University of Wisconsin and Milwaukee in the film program. Um, so right now, um, the Poor Farm, you know, hosts multiple installations, including um, um, some new multi-channel videos. These are just some examples. He really deals with language. He deals, of course, with native identities as well. Um, it's a really beautiful exhibition. In addition, uh, upstairs are uh, we installed a handful of these photographs that he's been making. And these photographs, you can, if I walk you through them, you'll be able to kind of understand how they're made and what you're looking at. He's basically taking photographs of transparencies of landscapes that are overlaid on the bed of an overhead projector, right? So we can understand that kind of overhead um, uh, white frame. And then he scratches in, you can kind of see at the bottom there, he scratches in some text as well. Now I'm going to just close the screen for a second. We're going to, so that's the poor farm. The poor farm um, is interesting. I wanna say one thing about the poor farm. Um, I'm very happy to actually uh, be able to tell you that uh, the Poor Farm is now going to become a re-granting agency for um, the Warhol Foundation. So we're going to be giving uh, um, Warhol uh, support uh, to Wisconsin artists, the first in the state of, the, of Wisconsin. So it's quite an honor to be, an, uh, to be able to um, support artists that way as well, in addition to giving them exhibitions or working on publications. 
Um, so as I said, the poor farm has been moving uh, along since 2009. And now I'm going to show you um, this quick little video. Be patient. Right. Um, I show you that uh, because it's it marks a transition. This little space here. This was the original suburban. Um, this is a gallery I've been running with my husband in Oak Park since um, 1999. And in 2015, really close to after this artist project, uh, we moved the Suburban to Milwaukee. So I wanna just show you a couple of projects of the Suburban in this space. Um, a little bit about this project. Uh, the woman who, the artist who uh, approached us uh, with this idea um, was a grad student of mine. I worked with her very closely. Um, after she graduated from the School of the Art Institute, I hired her to teach some classes um, in the painting and drawing program. And she's done a lot of work for me. We became very close. Uh, she's well known in Chicago. She did her undergraduate work at the School of the Art Institute. She's from Chicago. She uh, started Julius Caesar, which is a very important artist run project space. And she really needed to get some momentum to get out of the city. She felt trapped in Chicago. And I trust Dana. She's very smart um, uh, intellectually. Her work is terrific. And uh, she asked if she uh, could uh, drive a car into the suburban. And you have to understand the psychology of that. Um, that is a little mother-daughter relationship. That is um, you know, a boss-worker uh, relationship, a mentor-artist relationship. Um, you know, Really easy psychologies there. Um, she also knew that the Suburban has been running for a while and I, she was recognizing that it was um, kind of floating along. You know, we're looking at 10, 15 years and it really needed, I needed to pay attention to it again. And she drew my attention to it by uh, literally buying a car and driving, uh, driving into it. So that's what was going on there. Um, a couple exhibitions that happened in the spaces in Oak Park in Chicago. Um, uh, Well-known artist, Katerina Grossa. We had two exhibition spaces. There was that little building that Dana drove into and then um, another building next to it. And that's what you're looking at here. This is the building that Dana drove the car into. Katerina Grossa is a German artist, um, you know, really dealing with breaking down where object and architecture are through color, through big swashes of paint, really thinking about scale, really breaking down those hierarchies. Uh, the Suburban now, um, since 2015, it moved to Milwaukee, and this is an installation in the Milwaukee space. Again, it's very small. You're just looking at an installation of paintings by um, the artist Phyllis Brampson. She's a Chicago-based artist working kind of in the tradition of the Chicago imagists. And then also Matt Morris, a young conceptual artist um, in Chicago. And this is the building. Um, if you come and visit us in Wisconsin, um, in Milwaukee, uh, and visit the Suburban, the Suburban is on the first kind of storefront area. Um, there was an artist apartment upstairs um, uh, that we let artists who come visit us use. My studio is in the back, my Milwaukee studio. And right now, um, uh, because of COVID, we're projecting videos out the window. This is by an artist named Lenore Rinder. And basically Lenore uh, created a video for us that shows uh, people how to mail and vote in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is an important state with the upcoming election. So that is running 24 seven right now at the Suburban. Um, a little bit more about some of the curatorial projects. As Michael Ray said, I was responsible for uh, one third, one floor of the Breuer building um, uh, for the 2014 Whitney Biennial, which seems like a very long time ago. We're in a very different art world. We're in a very different world altogether. But this was my floor. Um, you see a Laura Owens painting here, Jacqueline Humphreys, uh, Sterling Ruby Ceramics. Um, you know, we can talk about that if you want. You know, it is an exhibition that could not be put together. Um, um, the, you know, the artists that I've selected, the whole configuration of the, the 2014 Whitney Biennial is an impossibility given, um, you know, the culture that we live in now. Um, in 2018, I was asked to be the artistic director of a new triennial that um, um, was launched in Cleveland, um, but it also included Akron and Oberlin. So it was a regional exhibition and I commissioned many artists. It was a really um, extraordinary opportunity. Um, 
when you're curating the Whitney Biennial uh, or other high profile exhibitions, it's still rare to get a chance to work with an artist to commission a new piece. Um, so uh, Front International in Cleveland was really an extraordinary opportunity for me. You're looking here at Yinka Shonabara. Um, this is called the American Library and it's at, it was installed at the Public Library in Cleveland, um, Cleveland, Ohio. And it looks small, this book stack looks small, but they're, you know, they tower over individuals. Um, he, uh, Yinka, uh, the, the prior to um, the American Library, a new commission uh, for this exhibition, um, he did uh, a similar project in Britain called the British Library. So basically he's taking uh, books and he's wrapping them with this ethnic uh, waxed uh, uh, cloth. And then um, on the spine, he has different authors, um, different American authors. Um, and what was really important to me with this exhibition was being able to engage not only museums, but also um, civic uh, sites such as the public library. This is Barbara Bloom. This is at the Ober at, um, Oberlin Allen Memorial Museum in which she was looking at the permanent collection, um, looking for perspectives and actually re uh, played out some of those uh, perspectives. And you can see it's in a Venturi building. You see this little Venturi column. And I bring that up just because I know you have a extraordinary Venturi building on campus. Um, Dawood Bay. Dawood Bay is a Friend. I've worked with him before. I did include his work in the 2014 Whitney Biennial. This is a commission at St. John's Church. This was an important church. It was um, a site um, in which uh, the Underground Railroad uh, uh, would um, uh, was part of. Um, people would be uh, uh, sheltered in um, uh, in this church. And for Dawood, who is a photographer, and it's very hard to see here, but he suspended these photographs and they're dark photographs and it's landscape. That would be, if you know his work, he uh, is known for his portraits of individuals. And here he was really trying to photograph the landscape in Northeastern Ohio, the movement of um, uh, uh, slaves from the South towards Canada. And again, uh, Cleveland being on Lake Erie being a stop um, before one would get over to Canada. So it was really an important site and it was wonderful to work with Dawood. Um, being a photographer, you know, we, I introduced this as a site to him. Um, St. John's Church uh, talked about its history. And, you know, Dawood uh, was interested in hanging photographs on a wall, right? This is what you do as a photographer. And then really spending time, um, you know, over the course in developing this exhibition, you know, talking about what it would mean to suspend these two-sided uh, photographs in the church itself, in the body of the church where um, individuals would be. Um, I think I have two more images of Front International. This was uh, 2018, as I said. Um, the next Front International was supposed to happen next year, but because of COVID, it's been postponed. A lot of institutions, as we all know, um, it's a very difficult time to raise money and such. Um, what you're looking at here is an installation in Cleveland's Federal Reserve Building. Um, this is by the artist uh, Philip Vanderheiden. It's a multi-channel video that really looks at abstraction and capital. How um, it's uh, you know he's he, he, if you over the course of the kind of video um, and the pulsing of um, the soundtrack, you see um, signifiers of wealth, gold coins and other kinds of signifiers. And as it kind of rotates and turns, it's really this interesting critique of capital right at the house, right, right in the Federal Reserve. So that was a kind of wonderful thing. And be, again, working with another civic structure. Um, and then finally, uh, two more examples of work that I was able to uh, commission. Tony Tassett's very large hand that works as a pavilion. Um, and then uh, Kay Rosen, um, um, a, 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 a mural um, in downtown Cleveland. So that was a really terrific project. That was a nice follow-up to, um, to uh, the 2014 Whitney Biennial, um, particularly being able to work with artists. I'm right now working uh, in Milwaukee on Sculpture Milwaukee, which is an annual exhibition that brings sculpture to downtown Milwaukee. Um, and I'm so proud to have this piece. This is by the artist uh, Thomas Price. He's a black British artist who makes these very large monumental size figures um, of, uh, of, of black figures. There's one um, of a woman um, that was just installed in a park in the East End of London. And uh, we have this figure here, it's great. Um, and it also stands in front of um, um, a banking building um, and really speaks to the lack of diversity um, uh, in a certain kind of industry, but also in a, a signifying piece of architecture in Milwaukee. It's a really beautiful piece. Um, 
This is Tony Tassett again. This is his Blob Monster, and I installed Blob Monster, Monster in front of the Federal Building in downtown Milwaukee. Um, Julian Opie, this is an animated uh, piece. Again, it's all along uh, Wisconsin Avenue for the most part, which is our uh, the city of Milwaukee's kind of main um, intersecting downtown. Um, you know, and like many um, former Rust Belt cities, um, you know, the downtown is relatively depleted. So how do we get to um, energize and to think culturally about um, our city? So that's what's going on there. Um, like I said, it's an annual exhibition. Now I'm going to kind of quickly go through um, my own work. Um, as a means of introduction, I'm showing you an installation of a painting, um, one of my paintings, and um, a cast bronze work. I'll show you more cast bronze and cast iron work at a Mies van der Rohe building in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, I'm really thinking about domesticity, um, thinking about modernism, um, uh, particularly with Mies, thinking about the um, uh, uh, the porousness of the structures, the perpendicular qualities um, of his glass uh, buildings for the most part. Um, gingham is something that I've engaged in quite regularly as a motif, gingham being something that's, you know, terribly recognizable. Um, you know, I, I came to gingham by looking kind of intently at uh, tablecloths of Bonard paintings and thinking what gingham would mean if I would bring it into the 20th century and flipped it up and made it flat. Um, it's still absolutely recognizable, right? We cannot not think about, you know, targets, I don't know, spring launch, um, you know, men's shirts, um, you know, gingham is prosaic. It is everywhere. It migrates uh, in, uh, it migrates um, economies. Um, it's just everywhere. And uh, to be able to think about gingham, not necessarily as a cultural signifier, but thinking of it as an abstraction, a grid structure, um, is something that I'm really um, continuously interested in. So that is a motif that I continue to work on in the studio. This little funny object that you see down here, there's some uh, uh, rolled up uh, crocheted blankets that have been cast. Some other work, again, you're going to get a sense of Repetition, which is very important. Um, dependability uh, that comes from repetition is more uh, important than ever. Um, and also the relationship to the domestic, that which is in uh, the everyday. It's within our vernacular purview, um, things that we encounter. Um, and uh, you know, if we slow down enough, we can appreciate the regularity. Um, uh, we can appreciate the dependability of them showing up um, you know, in our fridge when we open the door if we're thinking about egg carts egg cartons. So these are cast uh, uh, ironworks that I made at the Kohler factory in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, I continue to do work for them. I'll show you some examples of further work that I have um, engaged in, um, but this is just some some work that uh, I did there. Uh, these are large scale uh, bronze works, um, again, based on the vernacular crocheted blanket that probably uh, that we all know very well that probably lays over the back of our couch um, and thinking about uh, what that means um, when they're cast in bronze. I would use um, the template uh, of the blanket pretty regularly as um, a pattern for painting. And so all of these blankets that I have accrued over the years, what did I do with them? Um, in this move from Chicago to Milwaukee that happened in 2015, um, you know, I could either, you know, dump these uh, um, blankets that, you know, given over their pattern to paintings in the dumpster, or I could cast them in a lost wax process in which the, uh, the blanket itself would be burnt out in the process. So kind of a monument to not only um, a painting process, um, but also to the uh, domesticity into women's work. You can imagine all of the, um, again, relatively obvious signifiers that come with that. The project that I'm working on now is at a new museum um, in uh, uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, the John Michael Kohler Arts Center is there. The John Michael Kohler Arts Center is becoming more and more well known. It collects artists' environments and um, visionary artists' environments or outsider artists' environments. And uh, the woman who runs the John Michael Kohler Arts Center um, decided to build a new museum um, that will open next year and it's called the Art Preserve where all these environments, um, you know, full houses, full interiors of these outsider artists were recreated or are recreated and the work is installed. So I was commissioned uh, to uh, 
do um, a room um, there as well. And you're just seeing an example of all of these tiles. So I've been working in the Kohler uh, uh, factory, both in the ceramic area, which we call um, pottery and in um, cast metal. So you can see, I think I have a detail. What you're looking at here are, I'm hand building, slip casting all of these tiles, which, you know, tiles are, again, vernacular, you can pick them up at the tile warehouse, but I handmade each one of them, uh, hand decaled uh, the gingham tiles, um, hand built, again, a lot of these other relief tiles, and then these are brass tiles that I cast. Um, so you can get a sense of uh, the kind of relief, this kind of all over pattern. And in juxtaposition with uh, this room, um, I'm going to, I'm in the process now of slip casting all of the elements um, um, to a custodium cart um, that will be in juxtaposition. And uh, there's a long story behind there. It has to do with my work at the Kohler factory and encountering, encountering um, and enjoying my conversations with the people who actually come into the very dirty studios in the foundry and kind of ask what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, this one woman, Yeni, she was from Honduras um, having long conversations with her, but also within this factory structure being terribly discriminated against. So it really is a kind of a dedication to um, those who take care of us, who um, a kind of maintenance. And then in Wisconsin dealing with, um, uh, you know, the problems of immigration. Um, now, uh, this is the studio. Remember I showed you the outside of uh, the Suburban, um, that yellow building uh, with the projection in the window. Uh, this is my studio um, right now. I'm working um, not there. Um, I'm working in uh, rural Wisconsin, as I was saying, and I'll show you that the studio that I'm in in just a bit. Um, but uh, I do go back and forth between Milwaukee. I have a, a daughter who's still in school uh, there remotely and she gets better connection when we're in Milwaukee. Um, so anyways, uh, this is what you're seeing. I've been working on these uh, very strange um, uh, uh, paintings that obviously come from, um, you know, cornflake boxes, the motif, again, that which is something that we see on a daily basis, but also starting to pare down some of that information so we can see them abstractly. And thinking about texture, how does texture kind of play into that? Thinking about, um, you know, the regularity of touch and pattern. Um, so, you know, within the field of thinking about a gingham, which can be much more abstract than the cornflake box, but also thinking about these graphics. So that's what's happening down there. Um, and the studio that I'm in, now in rural Wisconsin, um, you know, just down the lane from the poor farm. Um, you know, it was a small studio, I share it with my husband and I'm, I've been working on these paintings um, since uh, we uh, encamped in March. When my school shut down, when the School of the Art Institute shut down, my family and I, you know, came up here to um, the cottage that we have and to the poor farm and to the little studio, really thinking about, um, you know, wh what kind of painting does one make now? I can continue with, cornflake boxes. I can continue with thinking about gingham. I can continue thinking about some of the other motifs I evolved over the years. Um, uh, I've been working for the last couple years, still working on the installation at the, uh, the preserve, which is a lot of pattern, um, a lot of kind of energies pressed up against each other, thinking about Jennifer Bartlett in that um, um, installation. But here, thinking differently, right? We all understand that these conditions um, that we're in now uh, change our relationship to time and place. And how do I respond to a uh, pattern, um, to regularity, to dependability, um, to repetition within this new condition of time? So I started working on these paintings uh, and I'll show you this one, but I'll show you where its source is. Its source comes from burlap, right? So. I take burlap and I de-weave it, right? So I make patterns in burlap by pulling out warp and weft strings. And this is something that I've been doing for a while. I've been casting them, but then starting to think about, and the, the burlap has always been difficult because it's so precise, it's so tight, that weave is so tight, that little space between the warp and the weft is not like a crocheted or um, um, a knit blanket. It's something that, again, is a simple weave, but it's a tight weave. So having to kind of pull out pattern, and then creating an index over a surface, right? Creating its index um, very much like a stencil using the burlap um, uh, patterns as a stencil, going through and carefully filling in that negative space again. So it's this kind of funny relationship. I keep thinking of a Penelope, um, you know, the, 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 the 
women from Greek lore who would weave during the day and de-weave at night and never kind of make progress. And what does it mean to kind of fill in the blanks of, you know, pulling out pattern and bringing it back together? What happens is the pattern doesn't disappear, but it becomes much more subtle. It becomes almost a ghost or an x-ray. And uh, so this is what I'm working on. I can do this. Again, what I'm saying is, is that, you know, it becomes much more tedious. It's a different kind of relationship to brushwork, handwork, fine motor work, a relationship to a tighter pattern. Um, and I can do that. I can kind of, I found my way here to think about pattern and dependability and the tediousness of it because we live in a whole different uh, frame of time. Um, time is different uh, given um, uh, COVID, given the space that I'm in, given, you know, this kind of exchange instead of, you know, being able to get on the plane and travel down to Houston or even go in to Chicago and uh, teach. So I'm um, really thinking differently. And then if uh, if you remember the black burlap that I just showed you, the black sprayed burlap um, uh, pattern, what happens when I fold that up and then have it cast? I have a really great foundry, um, both at Kohler, but also a small little mom and pop foundry in Milwaukee. And I have them try out and, and uh, you know, instead of, again, bringing them to the dumpster or you can't really recycle this material, um, but, uh, you know, have the cast, fold it up and have the cast. So trying to think about maintenance and think about um, moving one form into another form. So um, that's what I'm working on now. Um, and that's what I'm sharing with you. But uh, that was a big, fast overview of some of the things I'm thinking about. I do write a lot of criticism. I've been working on um, uh, an essay that will be published in a really good book. It's called Common Practice. It's about basketball. Um, and of course, the, uh, the social stratas, uh, the racial um, issues within um, basketball, the game, um, and how it has been used in contemporary art over the years from David Hammonds to uh, Carlos Rodon. So um, uh, that was great. That was really a terrific piece to write. But, you know, writing reviews, doing a lot of um, um, reviews for Art Forum on a pretty regular basis, um, you know, keeps me seeing things the best I can, a little bit of a hiatus when we couldn't get in to see exhibitions, but still um, finding other forms of writing, mostly catalog essays. Um, but that's kind of the overview of the work that I'm doing. I'd love to take questions. I'd love to talk about, you know, how and why and what our mandate is, what our obligation is to, to make shifts, to pivot within um, a culture that, uh, you know, brings us so many unknowns. Um, I think that is uh, the question that, um, you know, I ask you, but um, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's, take some, let's take some questions, Michael Ray. Hello, Michelle. Oops. Um, I have one question. First of all, can we show the video once more? And, and I'd sure. like you to repeat or frame exactly what you, um, what you just said um, going into the period of questioning. So we're going to try to show the video again because it didn't show up last time. And I think it's important. To oh, I'm it. sorry. It didn't show up. Can you see it now, Michael Ray? Um, or can you put it on? Yeah, it's on my screen. Hold on a second. Let me, uh, okay. I, I know what I can do here. I did this last time. I think I just have to share screen again. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, can you see this now? Yes. Okay. It's very short. Again, I apologize to everybody. Um, let's, uh, here we go. All right. Okay. There were several hands up and questions about uh, the video. So I just wanted to make sure yeah, that I folks were able to see it. Yeah, sorry folks. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than some crazy lady going on about something you can't see. Um, Michelle, um, at the end of your presentation, you mentioned uh, what you would like to talk about. Can you repeat that again? I didn't write it down. I don't, you know, I don't know how we talk about it. I would love to hear people's feedback. You know, I, I think it has to do, I, I was on a panel this summer. It was the Aspen Institute. And I was on a panel with the Astor Gates and uh, Thomas Fu, um, Enrique Martinez, uh, uh, Sile, Sile, and we were asked this very specific question. And it was, how has the global uh, health crisis 
and the urgency of social justice affected your practice? That's very simple, right? How is the world that we're living in, how, how has that changed? And I often speak to my grad students about, um, it's inevitable, right? That some vocabulary is going to shift because time shifts. Some vocabulary or material is going to shift because we have access, we have different kinds of access to material, right? So as things change, how are we then responsible to some of the ethical conditions that frame our culture? How do we take those on as well, right? So we have the structural shifts, very apparent. Me being here via Zoom is a, a structural shift, but how do we take on these other, um, these other ideas. Um, and, you know, I struggled with these paintings that I'm showing you at the end, the burlap paintings, right? The, the kind of um, ghosty uh, um, textile paintings, we'll call them that. Um, you know, they still have difference in them. Not one can be exactly alike, but they're yeah. all homogenized as well. So that's the question about, and I'm sure um, Michael Ray, you know, I, I know you're thinking about that. Aaron's thinking about it. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, before I go into the next question, I just wanted to say um, amazing work. And, and I am particularly fascinated about the burlap um, paintings because of um, the presence of the human mark in those paintings. You work within certain restraints but you make present and evident the validity of, of um, uh, the human mark in, in a period where so much art is, is leaning towards or moving towards the incorporation, the use, and even uh, the, the aesthetic of technology. So that's my, my take, but I'm gonna go to, we have a question. Um, I'm gonna go to the questions here. Um, we have a question, it states, um, I would love to hear what you're reading these days and also what you're having your students read. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a good question. So um, the last couple uh, last couple graduate seminars, so I'm teaching one right now and I usually teach one in the spring. Um, I've been really doubling down on uh, interpretation and formalism, um, formal critique and you know, I think I am so responsible as um, many of us in school, um, you know, formalism is not um, about taste. We often reduce it down to taste. You know, that red is something that I like. So therefore that is a, but, but form is so much more than that. And I say this, I said it to somebody this morning that form is always about order and order is always political, right? How do we put things together? How do we take them apart? They all have potentially political ramifications. And so really thinking about form and um, the best formal critique is coming out of um, English departments. Um, there is a, a book, it's a little bit older, it's 2015 and it's called Forms. And it is by a English professor um, at Cornell. She was at the University of Wisconsin and um, um, she, she left the, the Ivies and um, her name is Carolyn Levine. Carolyn Levine is uh, somebody I keep very close. She's written a lot about art and democracy prior to her interest in forms. And I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent because I, I should have talked about this uh, when I was talking about my, my work and how the idea of uh, repetition is important, but how we're really changing up the game in terms of what we, we, what we think about um, in, in terms of uh, form forms right so i was talking to somebody this morning about the whole right the idea of the whole w h o l e you know the whole was something we wanted to take apart we've been taking that apart since um you know postmodern discourse kind of took hold here we dismantle right we uh we take apart um we uh deconstruct right because we know that the whole is uh contained and there are some people within the sphere and some people outside of the circle, right? If you think of the whole, not everybody can be part of the whole. So it had power, it had authority. So we took it down, right? But now when we're thinking, uh, when we're in a culture of such great partisanship, the idea of the whole unifies us. We still acknowledge that not everybody can be part of it, but it is uh, starting to think about things that, you know, the idea of the universal, you know, well, that's a hard thing to say. We can't really talk about the universal because there's no such thing. Um, but when we start thinking about these bigger containers, they really help us, uh, I feel, and this is her argument and I, I support this, 
They help us start seeing um, the interdependency of difference, how difference can be held together. And that is something that is important in, uh, in the conversations around form or formalism. Or Fred Moten is talking to Julie Mahertu on, um, oh gosh, what night is that? Uh, Thursday night this week about color, right? Um, the form of color and how political that can be. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading form. I'm reading about formalism um, right now. Long answer. Carolyn Levine, um, the, the book is called Form and it's 2015. Okay, we're gonna go to our next question. And, and that is, um, how are you able to, do, to be so prolific in your own art making while being a writer, professor, running a nonprofit space? I know you have children. So how have you managed to do all of this? Yeah, um, well, there's some things I don't do well, and that is this. Um, I, you know, these things do really well if you're a good storyteller. I don't, you know, I, I don't really have a good story and I'm just not a good storyteller, um, but I like to work. I like to put my head down and get to the maintenance of things. Um, uh, I don't, you know, there's momentum. It's something about, an, it's another form, right? The form of momentum. Um, and I have to keep moving. Um, you know, some of it, uh, has to do with you know having a family and um, you know different uh, developmental uh, uh, um, developments of your of your of, of your kids right that they're always requiring change and different kinds of uh, relationship to time and to activity and I think I've always just been pulled that way it's it's really about a kind of momentum and I'm afraid to stop maybe it's a psychology maybe you know if I stop I die it's one of those kind of shark like things. Um, but I know what I don't do well. Uh, I know what I have to do, um, and I know what I love, and that is uh, talking about art and talking with artists. And um, um, yeah, that that uh, that's a, a really easy thing to keep things moving. I think we have a question that someone wants to uh, present to you themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that what we have? No. Okay, um, the next question is, do you feel it is our responsibility to make art that re uh, responds to what is going on in our community and or making art how we feel and see and are see? You know, it, it may be a personal responsibility. Um, it's not my responsibility. Um, you know, we, how do I want to jump into this? It's, it's, a, it's a big question, right? Um, I have conversations all the time. Um, you know, we're kind of delving into the ethics of the local or even hyper locality, right? Taking care of the community, that which is in reach, that absolutely has to happen. But you can't have the local or a community without understanding it in relationship to region. And you can't have region without understanding it in relationship to maybe worldliness, right? So it's important not to, you know, um, over fetishize, um, you know, a single proximity to um, an idea or to community, we also have to kind of keep opening it up um, for it to live. Um, so that is, that's interesting to me. Um, you know, I've been thinking about regionality. I, I, in 2016, I curated the Portland Biennial. So that's a statewide biennial and the Northwest was always a mystery to me. It has different, uh, uh, just structured very differently, different kind of landscape. And, um, you know, really thinking about regionality then, but actually thinking then within regionality, how um, that extends itself to, uh, you know, um, global discourses or, um, you know, local discourses, um, communities in Portland. So we have a, our next question slash statement, uh, Jamie Hart, would you like to present? Because it seems like you have something you'd like to say as well to Michelle. Can we get Jamie to present her question? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, so I, I guess I, I sent, I sent notes that I was writing down, writing down, I guess, but I just wrote, um, things that you were saying that made me think about how dependability and repetition are like in some ways 
in which minimalism can now be understood as relevant in the face of a loss of the consistency and structure. And then you talked about time. And I was wondering what connections exist between time as a structure or to you, what connections exist between time as a structure as this consistent everyday structure, the everydayness of it, and then the consistency or reliability of cornflake boxes and burlap. And then wondering if the use of the cornflake box is like a form of therapy for the loss of structure of time, or maybe it's an echo of the loss of structure of time in some way. And then especially thinking about returning to something like that as an answer to the, or investigation to like the larger questions that you're thinking about in terms of this giant structural shift currently, like getting into the micro specificity as a way as like the only way to think about this grander thing. Um, yeah. I don't know if that is. Yeah, that's a lot, Jamie. Let me, um, um, let me take a stab at it and then circle, pull me back in when I you know, uh, don't address some of those questions because they're all, all, all good um, and all complex. Um, so uh, so if, if, let's just take a, the, that cornflake box I showed you. We, you. That one you guys all can recall. Um, so if I am in art school as a young impressionable person many, many decades ago now, let's say that 80s, that cornflake box represented a relationship to abstraction, to commodity. It had a relationship to pop, right, to Warhol. Um, but it was also, I keep thinking of Arturo Herrera, somebody who I went to school with um, in Chicago, and really thinking about how Again, um, you know, a little bit of high and low being played out, right? The low form of, uh, you know, that which is vernacular found and thinking about bringing that to a place of abstraction, right? Which has a haughty, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, deeper intellectual engagement with how we think about things. So I always was drawn to that which is within my socioeconomic uh, uh, framework, which is very middle class, uh, very Midwestern. Um, and looking for uh, you know abstractions and thinking about conversations and and critique right within those things. So now, if you think about that corn box, uh, cornflake box, what I'm talking about and what you picked up on, Jamie, are relationships to the everyday, where it came from, some of that criticality that was always there or is built into my you know art, artistic DNA. Um, you know, takes not front stage, but backstage. I can still say it's there to a certain degree. The more I make, the more kind of more holy and they'll become, the more kind of play on value they have. But right now, you heard me talk about them as a kind of dependency, a knowability, right? In a world that there is so much unknown, so much fiction or just darn right lies being perpetuated, um, you know, through the kind of, uh, you know, um, dicey attachment of social media, that the dependable kind of fixture in your kitchen cabinet on a daily basis gives you something to hang on to. And so I'm talking about that now with, um, uh, because that's the world we're living in. So, so you're right. So time, um, relationship to knowing, unknowing, what do I need to get through the day? What do I need as a stable ground before I can step into uh, my Zoom graduate seminar and talk about abstraction. Um, you know, I need that kind of dependability um, that's coming from there. So you're right. Um, you said it wasn't um, cathartic uh, therapy. I think you used the word therapy. Um, yeah, and to some degree, I think that is right. The, um, you know, the groundwork that one needs, uh, that familiarity to hold on to, to push through into the world that is just there's so much unknowns um is a probably a kind of uh therapy and again very different that's almost the other end to the kind of criticality uh that um you know uh painting cornflake boxes or graham cracker boxes that i did in 1988 um you know uh had a different kind of relationship but you know called from the same thing the same kind of um you know objecthood they have the same kind of objecthood as well um so uh, that that's one answer to some of your questions. Yeah, I think that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have another question from, uh, well, negative 
put your name here. Uh, the question is, what role does representational painting have in 2020 and in the near future? Yeah, uh, I talked to a couple uh, of you this morning. We talked about uh, genre, right? And how genre theory is uh, right back in the academy. And, and, you know, genre makes a lot of sense right now. And I put together an exhibition, um, the ICA in Maine on genre. Um, genre is something we can all, for the most part, I mean, it may not be universal, but genre within uh, the art world, uh, you know, we can default to the simple still life portraiture and uh, landscape is knowable. We can agree on that, right? We can agree that that's a landscape with trees, but then we can interpret it as an expressionistic landscape or, um, you know, a, 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 that uh, landscape that just has a straight uh, 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 verisimilitude. Um, you know, we, we can then go into a different kind of interpretation that reflects our own individual understanding of what that is. Um, so genre is important but when it, it, as an organizing structure, but when we think about figure painting right now, you know, ooh, ah, I, you know I, I, I always go back to Kerry James Marshall, um, a conversation I had with him in Chicago not too long ago, and it's about that, right, that um, it makes sense to me why we are a culture of transaction right now, where um, in in a, in a place in which fiction and, and lies and expanded truth um, permeate uh, how we navigate um, our political world, um, particularly, but the everyday, that a transaction means that we're not getting screwed, right? Um, I will give you this if you give me that. It's very clear, right? It's very clean. And uh, I, wanna, I want to think about transaction in relationship to representation, um, uh, or figure painting, or was it realism? Michael Ray, what, what was the question? Was it was it realism? Was part of the question? It was representational art. Representation. Thank you. Representation. Right. So, um, uh, what is representational? So, so making sure it's clear. Right. So, an example I used this morning was the profound amount of figure painting that depicts black bodies and spaces there is no getting that wrong, right? There is little ambiguity to it. And we can't risk that being wrong. Uh, you know, this uh, figure painting, subject of those figure paintings has to be clear. Um, so I understand that, but, uh, and I, I, you know, this is a, a, a great shift in culture. It's one of the kind of uh, great moments that we're living in um, when we're able to see, you know, the subject, the, 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 the subject of the figure being represented in who that figure is. Um, but it's not, uh, there's, there's no room for ambiguity in the politics of anti-racism um, and how we're thinking about that with institutions and within the visual arts. So um, that's where we're at. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I applaud that. I'm so glad we are here. Um, so that's how I see, that's how I understand, um, you know, representation right now, that it is, it needs to be transactional, it needs to be clear, because that is the power shift that we're seeing. That is the shift in culture. Those who have been marginalized and left behind need to come to the fore, and there is, uh, you know, and that's what we're talking about, and that's what we're seeing. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's what we should be seeing. Okay, I have another one. Um, this person is interested in hearing more about the burlap paintings as, as as they relate to uh, any change in your process during the COVID times, specifically as it relates to the slowing down we are all experiencing yeah. process and content. Yeah. If you could yeah. expound uh, on that. No, I will expound on that. Um, it, and, it, you know, I, I wish it was, I wish it was that simple, right? We're, we're given a new context and now we do something to respond to that, um, you know, but we carry along uh, a relationship of what we've done before, right? Um, uh, you know, I'm still invested and will remain to my death invested in abstraction and repetition um, uh, and repetition's relationship to time and its dependability and, and everything I've talked about. Um, so I have to pull that into the condition that we're in. And that was hard. Let me tell you that, um, you know, being up here in, you know, snowy cold March um, and thinking that at uh, 57 years old, that 
coming around to painting and creating a new motif in painting given these new conditions should not be difficult. I should be able to go to the studio and find that place. And it was a struggle. It was a material struggle. It was a scale struggle. It was a, a, a struggle around color. Um, you know, I went from full spectrum down to, um, you know, a, a field of gray. And, uh, you know, I, I just kept every, every night when I went to bed, I just said, why is it so hard? Like I've given over so much of my life to, uh, you know, not only, you know, um, analyzing, loving, looking at painting and making a painting that it, this shouldn't be difficult. And it was. Um, so lots of trial and error. And, you know, I would say that only in the last month have I felt that I've hit on a process and of material um, that, that can work. And it is about a tediousness. Um, it is about, again, I, I am using a tiny brush. I've never used a tiny brush. Um, and, you know, to fill in that, you know, minuscule space between the warp and weft, that little space in burlap, to be able to, um, you know, fill that in with a touch of titanium white paint. Um, you know, it takes freaking forever, but I have forever. Uh, I have a different kind of relationship with time. So it gives me the opportunity to think about um, tighter, um, uh, uh, a tighter, um, more precise, um, more intimate uh, relationship to um, uh, what pattern is, what pattern can be. It was Michelle, rough. Yeah. <laughs> when you cast your croquet blankets, you spoke about them referencing feminine femininity and domesticity. Do you feel that the metal casting and the metal work is more traditionally masculine craft or a masculine craft? And does yeah. it change the presentation of the female craft and softness and I'm sorry, softness of the piece of the work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, this is a, this is a, where again, I'm, I'm very, very simple. And this is, uh, I like to play with dualities. Uh, you know, um, uh, I like to play with uh, uh, false equivalencies, right? So yes, um, there is a kind of a, a, a traditional um, uh, gender split going on, but there's also this person who asked this question is perfectly aware that there's also hard soft, right? There's a, a, the process, right? I am, I sit here and I'm, making granny squares right now because I need to do that to, to help me think and cognate. Um, so there is that kind of work versus, you know, entering into, um, entering into a, a foundry, right? Um, the paradox of a lot of, uh, w uh, just to, to speak a little bit of the bronze piece that was the tall um, bronze work with the kind of points on top, you know, basically I'm taking a textile into the foundry and I dip it in wax, right? If anybody knows lost wax process, I take this thing, it stretches, it's hot. I can, they're as tall as my body and I'm a very tall person. Um, and uh, it's fast and it, it becomes hard and it gets cast. Like that process is, as, it's quicker than charcoal drawing. Right, so there is that play between the tediousness of me making knot after knot after knot with a crochet, and then the quickness of it being a fixed form, and then more labor being uh, on that back end of um, the ceramic shell being made and the uh, the ceramic shell being burnt out and the, the, going through that whole process. So um, it's a very good question, but it also points to much of my work, which deals with these, again, kind of very false dichotomies. This is a way of knowing the world. I know it's not true. Black and white is not true, but they help me navigate, right? They help me with the complexities and the subtleties if I have these markers. And this is what we have to do. Every day we get out of bed and we say, this is what's true today, but we have to be aware that tomorrow we get out of bed and we may have to remake what is true. And uh, so I'm, what you're seeing in a lot of the work are these, uh, um, again, uh, um, dualities that I work with as guides uh, to, you know, uh, to get into abstractions and get into the difficulty of thinking about time and thinking into uh, thinking about abstraction. Um, you know, what is just? That is a crazy thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, these are deep questions that probably don't really have great answers. So you need these parameters. Before we go to our next uh, question, which um... Uh, I think this person is going to ask, wants to ask you personally. Uh, I have a quick question, and, and that is about process. Can you, can you talk about um, 
uh, questions that take place during the actual exploration that's uh, a part of attraction. So often than not, as image makers, I think we, um, we get caught up in the idea of what art should look like, uh, not necessarily what it should feel like, but what it should look like, what has been validated within the canon, what has been validated uh, within a close proximity um, and values associated or attached. And, and you stated uh, earlier that I thought it was so important. Uh, you spoke about taste mm -hmm. and relationship to, to the formal uh, critique. And, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. So you, can you talk about the process a little bit more? Because there's a lot of abstraction that's being done, but in some cases, the, um, uh, it lacks the kind of energy necessary to evoke thought, uh, to promote or evoke an emotional connection with and to its viewer. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, you know, this is why I teach classes on um, interpretation and critique. And, and again, coming out of the literary tradition or literary critique, that always helps me out. They do a really good job thinking about different forms of uh, interpretation, um, you know, whether it's excessive interpretation or mood interpretation or post critique, um, you know, it's so rich. Um, but again, I think I like your question a lot, um, Michael Ray, because, you know, we don't what we do is, and, and you know this, everybody in the professional world will, you know, encounter an abstraction and, you know, the person that's representing that work, let's say it's your gallerist, you know, will tell the story about you, you know, this is, this is a lady who's in Wisconsin and she runs exhibition spaces and she teaches at the School of the Art Institute. And, you know, unless we're, you know, the academy or again, the literary discourse, you know, I don't see us doing the hard work of doing the deep interpretation. This goes back a little bit to transaction, right? So, you know, we go to the Met and we give $25 because we don't live in the borough and we expect to be told what we're seeing, right? We, we read that text on the side. Um, we just have gotten really lazy at doing um, interpretation and, um, uh, you know, the abstraction is difficult. It's always been difficult. And because formalism or uh, yeah, formalism has been kind of reduced as, um, you know, not interesting. It doesn't get at uh, what is called the hermeneutics of suspicion, uh, that deep excavation of telling you, Michael Ray, what's in your work that you don't even know. I'm just going to do the deep work and tell you what is there that you have no idea. That is fascinating to me, but that's not the only way of taking something apart. I can take apart you know, everything from graphic quality to, again, uh, you know, color, uh, texture, surface, scale, all of that can have multiple, uh, you can open that up and find, you know, deep uh, relationships to the social, to the political. Um, but we have to be willing to take that chance and go there. And, you know, we, I don't, you know, we do that in critique, right? We all host these critiques. But for some reason, out in the world of commerce, um, within the professional world, uh, you don't see that very often. You just don't see it enough. So, is is there much of a, a balance between that kind of uh, deep critical analysis, deconstruction, and taking apart? Um, uh, um, you know, in, in that you would promote in in art making, as opposed to following the trends. For example, because so often, so often the trends are, you know, can provide a space for people to gain access into uh, a realm of more visibility. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. but I would say, I would question longevity with regards to gaining access. But I think that work that is more invested in uh, a critical deconstruction. Uh, produces more work over time. I'm looking at, you know, what is evidence of, of uh, critical thinking behind you. And yeah, I, I just want, I would like to expose, you know, that aspect of the looking and, and the questioning to uh, whomever is online participating in this, um, uh, in this presentation. Yeah. And, you know, I have the long arc of seeing as I was, you know, giving the example of the cornflake box over time that, you know, one kind of discourse and interpretation in the late 90s, uh, late 80s is very different than the interpretation we have now. It changes. And we as artists have to be willing 
to allow for that change to happen. So, you know, it's never fixed in time. Like that, you know, the, I don't know, the, the graham cracker box painting that I made in 1991, you know, I, I have to continuously understand its new meaning in the new context that we live. And I have to speak to that. It doesn't, it's not fixed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the work we have to do. We're constantly, um, you know, understanding how meaning works and how context and time shifts that and changes that. Um, you know, I, I am pretty promiscuous when I, uh, uh in terms of, exhibiting my work. You know, if I have a grad student who's opening up a space in the garage and they want a, a, a painting, I say yes, because I learn about it. It's a context that I may not understand or even within the experimentation of my studio back here, you know, there's still limitations there. So when it goes out into the world, I can understand other ways of coming to know it. And, you know, I still, um, you know, I, 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 I think I'm pretty facile in thinking um, about not only my work, but other people's work. That's why I do a lot of critical writing. But, you know, it's inevitable that the work goes into the world and I'll, see, I'll hear an interpretation that never even occurred to me and it seems so obvious. And that's exciting. And I know artists who get really frustrated. They want to close down that interpretation. They want it only to mean, you know, this. And if it doesn't convey it perfectly, uh, you know, to an audience, your intention to the audience in that direct line, it's a failure. And that's dreadful. I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate transaction there. Uh, you know, why, when there could be so many other ways that this object can help us understand who we are, what's the world that we live in, um, use it as a tool. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be right. Uh, I appreciate your, your trust um, and, and, and how you as an artist um, exist in transforming and exploring what's possible, what's new, what I, what I question, all of those kinds of ideas. I think that those are significant to any kind of concepts of longevity uh, with regards to creativity. We have another question uh, that uh, this person wants to um, ask you personally. So can we get this person on? Doug Walsh, here we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, um, hi, thank you so much for your time and, and for um, sharing everything that you did. My question is just in thinking about your discussion of dependability and objects having dependability, um, what are the three most essential things in your studio? Um, they could be created works or just things that you use to make other works or mm -hmm. objects collected. Wow, that is a super hard question. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Dependability. Uh, wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. It may be more. That's so. That's so interesting because it feels like I'm, I'm being caught up a little bit because I'm talking about you know the you know, the, the nameable, priceable dependency of a cereal box. And then when I think about the studio, you know, I, all right, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, I'm going to have to answer it um, not by what is in the studio, but what supports the studio. And, you know, everything in the studio, I think, you know, it's tools, um, you know, I take care of them. I'm very neat and very organized. Um, that helps me, uh, uh, you know, uh, be able to kind of focus and, and, and think. But, you know, this goes to a privilege and I'm, you know, I, you all need to know that I sit here in a very privileged position. Um, first of all, I'm an artist who made it this far. Um, and, you know, there's no taking that away from me now. And I know many young artists, it's tenuous, right? It's, it's a tenuous scenario because there are so many artists in the world. So I emerged out of a different condition. I have a teaching job. I am grateful for my teaching job. It gives me dependability. Um, you know, the world of labor and work, not great right now. Um, so I have that, I have a family and I have, uh, you know, a, a husband and I have my kids, you know, like them to a certain degree and they like me to a certain degree. But, uh, you know, if, if it all goes bad, they will have to love me and I will always love them. And those are foundations. Those are just conditions of um, uh, social institutions and work that um, I really need to be able to sit down and for 12 hours paint little white dots on a, a, a 
uh, on a linen support. Um, and if I don't have them, I, you know, if I, I didn't have that other kind of support, I wouldn't do that. So I, I can't answer that question except by pointing to, um, you know, the grateful institutions that are outside of the studio that allow me to be in here. And the tools in here are, are important and I care for them and I explore with them. Um, but, uh, but that is how I have to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry, Doug. We have another question. How have your drawings changed since COVID? I hope the drawings changed COVID. And, and I think it's what I've been desperately trying to say, but awkwardly and not terribly articulately, is that um, they became tighter, tighter, slower, more tedious, um, more consuming. Um, you know, less loose, right? Um, if we're just talking about, um, you know, mark making, um, less fast. Um, there's also something that I'm playing with and it's a weird thing. And I, I you know, I think it's a found critique um, as opposed to an intentional critique, but I'm liking it very much. And I don't, maybe you caught on, maybe not. These, th these paintings, their lack of uh, contrast they have a little texture to them, but they are not, they do not photograph. They do not, they do not, they cannot circulate in the communication world of uh, uh, that, that artwork needs to circulate now, right? Um, you know, gallery shows are online, museums are going online. There seems to be almost a resistance um, and I am happy for that, right? I made decisions in which I'm making barely perceptible work for a camera lens. Um, um, or phone lens or whatever, whatever uh, mechanism is taking uh, its image. Um, and, you know, that does double down on uh, one concern I have about this world. And that is we're missing, I think I made the analogy to talking to somebody like, you know, we're working with a horse with only three legs, like they're not being in the presence of materiality in the thing itself. It feels like, you know, I'm only, you know, working with, you know, half of a rudder. It's very difficult um, not being in the presence of something. So what that tells me is that I'm, you know, I'm still material orientated. I still need that, you know, the object who tells me a lot. It gives me an affect um, uh, of the work that I don't have in this uh, element. So, um, yeah, maybe uh, I'm trying to think that way through or think through the inability to, you uh, photograph it. I can tell you that um, the people I work with on the commercial side of things, those commercial dealers, uh, you know, I don't even bother sending that information. I'll send them the work and if they want to try to photograph it, they can. But that is uh, um, me being brave in a world that says, you know, at one point having a commercial gallery was the end all of professionalism. We conflated, you know, the commercial with professional and we are in a whole different time. And I am so glad to be able to sit here and say that. You know, the criteria for how we succeed, you know, does not have a straight line to uh, museum institutions, nor the commercial galleries of Kelsey. Um, Kelsey doesn't even exist. So that is great. Right. That is That's so right. good. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, we have another question and the person wants to ask you the question specifically. So if we could get that person up. Here we go. Um, hi, uh, actually, you already answered my question. It's the question below me. Okay. Oh, do you have it, Michael Ray? Do you have it? No, I, I think it was. Um, oh, okay. Marky, uh, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? In person? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Michelle, this is Marky. And uh, you talked about your casting of these kind of like the piles or folded up woven blankets or the thread pulled burlap. And, you know, I imagine if they're folded up, they create this network of pores or porosity, which is really a kind of an irregular pattern or repetition. And I was just wondering if you'd ever made a derivative casting of that new porosity that you created. I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, porosity offers like repetition and pattern and uh, pathways and derivatives offer sort of an element of time each time you do something, uh, you know, 
re repeat it. And I I'm just wondering if you'd ever, you know, think about your patterns like that with that time element. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting, and that is you as a, a scientist uh, actually um, coming to the fore. Um, not not in those specific ways, Marky, but yeah, I think in a kind of um, art, you know, whatever the equivalent uh, thinking in terms of uh, pattern and alignment um, or disalignment um, happens within, as you were saying, um, you know, folds. So, you know, I think the cast work that you're referring to, particularly the folded cast work, the either rolled uh, crocheted uh, forms that, you know, were a little hard to see in that installation shot in the Mies van der Rohe building. But even at the end, that kind of relatively flat folded burlap, I mean, that compresses itself in a way. And, you know, the process itself neutralizes a lot of um, uh, what the kind of specificity of surface to a certain degree. Um, but it's the representation of a whole, like one still knows it's folded fabric, even though the kind of net, the uh, metric uh, of uh, pattern gets collapsed, right? Um, sometimes, I don't want to say more happens, but a, a different kind of pattern will emerge um, as well. Um, you know, I think I'm much more simple than your question. And that uh, uh, is such that um, if one thinks about the many, many gingham oil paintings, which really have a tooth to it, you know, they, it's, it's just the material world. This is a cliche. I'm, I'm giving you a cliche, a, a real cliche. And that is, that, you know, even though, you know, the pattern, the measuring, the math, um, you know, is always precise or as precise as, you know, uh, one can be, you know, the material of uh, the paint or the breakdown of my brush or the pressure of my hand will always make, you know, the same painting different. It's just a material, a materially different thing. And the same thing with casting, you know, the, I showed you strangely enough and I didn't talk about it, but I think you picked up on it. And that is that piece at the end, that weird, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it, but the folded burlap piece, that comes from a mold. I've never made a mold before. I always have burnouts, right, one-offs. Um, so now I have this mold and, you know, the mold will be different to a certain degree, um, but uh, yeah, trying to think about all those things. Um, and that's why I need my cornflake box to think about, you know, the variation, that subtle variation that you're talking about and how different it can be and how different, you know, meaning can be evoked by just a subtle shift. And you may be the only one who sees that subtle shift. I mean, that's what's really paradoxical, um, you know, when one sees, uh, I don't know, lines and lines and lines of cornflake boxes, you know, I know where they're all different, but, you know, for the viewer, the casual viewer, um, you know, it's like they, they have a, a similarity to them and that meaning that comes from difference doesn't, doesn't emerge. Thank you. All right, our next question um, is, Houston is often compared to Chicago in terms of it's ever rising yet always somehow behind position uh, in relationship to New York and LA. You spoke already, you spoke a bit about focusing on the local. What can you say more about what you'd recommend students to focus on who are committed to staying and working in a place like Houston? A, a wonderful place, I might add. Yes, it is a wonderful place. Um... Yeah, you know, I'll give you I'll give you my example. So, so Chicago and Houston have been compared, and and in in the uh, let's say pre two thousand and I don't know sixteen world, when we talked about economies in the art world that were uh, ridiculously um, flush, uh, you know, in Chicago we'd always say, uh, you know, Houston just has more money. You guys have the oil money. Like, there's a greater exchange that the, the you know, we have galleries in Chicago, but you know, most of our collectors will go to New York to buy work. Like we just don't have, we never had that. Um, so we always, you know, Chicago, Houston, from our side, it was always about, um, you know, uh, where your industry comes from, right? Thinking about economy. Um, but to scale, I think, you know, we're, we're scaled particularly um, similarly. Uh, you know, Chicago, Chicago is different than Houston. And I'll, I'll just explain Chicago. I moved to Milwaukee because I, because Chicago, um, drove me nuts. Um, and it drives me nuts because it should have all the freedom of not being New York, you know, not being the, you know, uh, what the, the vertical cultural 
center of uh, the United States and it should have the freedom of playing around with its second city status. Um, you know, it should think differently. And, you know, the people with cultural power in our city always doubled down on Chicago looking like New York. It wanted to, it could only succeed if it kind of used New York as a template. And that drove me crazy. Um, so I moved back to Milwaukee. I, you know, Milwaukee I was familiar with because I went to uh, undergrad there. And Milwaukee is, Milwaukee is almost the reverse. I like live, uh, uh, so I love Chicago now that I don't live there. And now that I live in Milwaukee, I like it a little bit less. It has small town thinking to it. Um, so this is, you know, this is a paradox I think we will all deal with. Um, uh, but yeah, I think every place, um, you know, will give you some challenging conditions and things that you will love about it. Um, you will uh, want to know how you can uh, contribute to a community, whether it's a cultural community, a political community, a you know, real uh, neighborhood block community. But more importantly, you know, it has to be a place that will allow you to be able to be a, a, a citizen um, and an artist at the same time. Um, so that means, you know, Milwaukee was, I was able to, you know, Milwaukee is a lot less expensive than Chicago to live. I could not afford a studio in Chicago. Um, Milwaukee, I could do that. And uh, that was important to my work at that time. That was one of the reasons why we moved, um, just because I needed to have uh, the, the space to, to be the artist that I needed to be. And I had to change my relationship to what, what, it, what I need, what I am in Milwaukee is very different as a citizen, as a contributor to culture is very different than my contributions to Chicago. Um, and, you know, equally frustrating, um, but that's just what it means to be in a society. Yeah, so stick, stay, stay around Houston. Houston's, Houston's terrific. And as the cultural centers are unaffordable, just unaffordable, you know, be in a place that, uh, um, you know, you can afford to do the work that you need to do. Don't let them tell you that you need to, you know, have five jobs to barely pay rent. Do we have any more questions? Comments? I think we have a hand up here. Or was that an earlier hand up? Emily? Do we have a question? Okay. I, you know, speaking of contributions, I mean, Cheryl, you've made significant contributions wherever you've been. And um, it's a testament to the power of an individual. And I think it's your, you are a shining example of what the future should look like uh, in terms of uh, creative production in the arts. I thank you, you inspire me, as well as so many of the, the comments we've had uh, from, from um, uh, questions that were posed. And the, the idea that you, you're, you're standing in the middle of being able to express yourself in different ways. The challenge for much of many of us as, as educators, I think, is to how do we nurture the arts? How do we create um, the, the future to step into um, uh, the space of an unknowing yeah. and, and, and a space of being. And I think you've done it so well. Um, if we could close with just this one question, and that's my question to you. Your, um, in your education, you decided to pursue an MA. If you could speak about that, that step, um, I think it's important because um, so many, well, we're both involved with academia and, and so much of, of uh, what we do as artists is oftentimes in academia, you know, there's not a way to describe it. And, and people are concerned with folks coming in, getting degrees and going out and what kind of jobs are they getting and are they able to um, take care of themselves. But you chose an MA and then an MFA, and you managed to use these two degrees in, in ways that uh, most artists choose an MA, I, I'm sorry, an MFA. So if you could expound about a little bit about that, I think it's important for uh, the, the people in the audience. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, um, you know, 
maybe a ham-fisted strategy at the time, and again, this was uh, late 80s into the 90s, um, Michael Ray, and, and you know, I was, uh, I, I was being pragmatic, quite honestly. Um, and this was a time when uh, it was um, reasonable uh, to um, attempt to think about uh, teaching at a university level. It's almost, it's, you know, there are unicorns now, a teaching job, a full-time teaching job is a, a unicorn. Um, but at that time, you know, I, I also knew I wanted to have a family, um, wanted to have kids. Uh, and, you know, I needed to, um, you know, be an artist. That means I would have to have time and some uh, money for materials and uh, pay mortgage and health care. So I just thought that if I had a master's degree in art history, that I could get a job at a community college where I could teach introduction to drawing and art appreciate uh, art appreciation, but I needed to have that history. And, you know, I was a pretty good undergrad uh, where I had my BFA, but I was kind of a, I was kind of terrible. I was not paying attention to art history. And I knew upon getting my BFA that, you know, I'm always going to be standing on history. I may have to undo some of that history. I may have to challenge that history, but I am going to be contributing to building it. And um, if I didn't know it uh, and I didn't understand the ideas, uh, uh, I couldn't, I, you know, it would, it would leave me in a deficit. So basically I was, you know, a bad art history student as an undergrad, knowing eventually knew I needed to, to understand uh, the field um, and the past in which I was uh, working toward a future um, in. And, uh, you know, also thinking about maybe strategically I could get, uh, you know, some part-time teaching at a community college <laughs> because I had both of them, both uh, degrees. You know. Outstanding, thank you. Um, I think we have one more question and this is from uh, Emily, are you there? And this will be our last question if it's, it is a question. Uh, here she is. Here we go. Hi, go Emily. Do you want, do you want to uh, text me the question in, in the chat and I could ask, oh, here we go. Your volume is off. Emily, I think you're muted. Okay, I, I think she's... Uh, her audio is not working. Our audio is not working. Do, Emily, would you like to text the question or put it in the chat? Okay. We'll, why don't we just, um, we'll wrap up here, but I, I would like to say on behalf of uh, our students, our community here at UH, uh, thank you so much. It's an extreme pleasure. Uh, to have had you uh, visit us and it would be great to have you back in the future. So much insight, so much uh, information um, and, and just evidence of, of how you've, um, you've, your trajectory as an artist and a scholar, um, I can't thank you enough. So continue much success of what you do. And uh, again, you inspire. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you finally, Michael Ray. And uh, yes. thank you, Karen. And uh, soon, I hope, in person. Yes, of course. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.